Welcome to It's All About the Benjamins, a financial literacy discussion that is meant to alleviate any fears that you may have concerning money. My name is Jamela Swift, and I am a 16-year veteran real estate agent in New York City with Keller Williams NYC. Today's episode is called Bling Bling, What is the Fire Movement, and how can it allow all of us to achieve financial freedom. My guests for today are two former Wall Street executives and present day millionaires, the Wealth Twins, Nadia and Nicole. Welcome ladies. Hello, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Thank you for joining me in this discussion. I'm so excited to speak to both of you. I watched your, your YouTube channel <laughs> it's quite interesting, all of the jewels that you're imparting. <laughs> Thank you. We're getting better every video, so. <laughs> okay, okay, I hear you. So now you both were working on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You escaped it. <laughs> and now, That's now, a very good, uh, good metaphor. We escaped it. <laughs> you escaped Wall Street, and now you're living as millionaires. So tell me, what, well, first, what firms did you work for? Okay, you, Nicole, you want to go first or should I go? Well, I, I'll, I'll take it. So actually straight out of college, Nadia and I both worked for Goldman Sachs. So it was uh, pretty interesting that we both worked at the same firm. I thought I would not work at the same place with her because we are, I don't know if we're officially identical twins, but we look identical enough that we are very confusing to people. But, yeah. you know, the doctor told our mother we weren't fraternal. We weren't identical, but I still doubt that. So my plan was not to work at the same place as Nadia, but it ended up that Goldman Sachs was the place that we both started working. Yeah, she was on the buy side. No, she was on, you're on the buy side, right? I was on asset management, so buy yeah, side. I was on the sales side. And then after Goldman Sachs, we both went into management consulting. I went into working for Accenture in their, um, their financial services division. And Nicole worked for a French consultant. Yeah, I went for a French boutique uh, management consulting firm, with, which was a spinoff of Deloitte and Touche. Okay. So then what were the steps that you took to, to leave Wall Street? Did you start to acquire real estate or did you just have a, a fully stacked portfolio that allowed you to feel comfortable enough to leave your jobs? Uh, I think the first thing before, I left Goldman uh, first and I did that because I was a high saver. So that was before I even owned any property or had millions in a bank. Mm -hmm. I was an able, and I was single at the time, I had enough in my bank account that would last me at least six months without a job. So I wasn't the happiest in my position. Mm -hmm. And one day it hit me that today is the day I'm leaving. And I left. Mm -hmm. So I, I credit that to my high savings. Then uh, afterwards, when I was working in management consulting, I had a family, I was married, and I knew that working in consulting is a very uh, tiring job. You can be anywhere in the world and you can work very long hours. Mm -hmm. I knew I couldn't do that and raise a family that the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So we did at the time have enough savings and investment portfolios. This was also before we actually brought our first property, but we had an investment portfolio that allowed me to uh, get out of the game. Okay. Same for me. I was able, I was a big saver. At one point I was saving 75% of my paycheck. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you're working in investment banks, your hands are very, your, your trading is very limited. You have to get a lot of sign offs on what you can trade. You have to wait um, like 60 days before you can sell something. Sometimes you're not allowed to buy certain trades because there might be some kind of conflict of interest based on the company that you're working for if they did the underwriting for that company. So our, po our investing portfolios didn't do much for us when we were in investment banks. When we left and went into management consulting, that came more into play. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I have this impression, and I know this is not true, but it's easy to think that anyone that has a financial service financial firm is wealthy. But I know working in real estate, no, real estate. That's not true. <laughs> We first started on Wall Street. I was making probably forty-five thousand. Like you're not making big bucks like that. There's very different positions within a bank. You do get paid a lot in certain positions, but a lot of positions you get paid um, on average what most of New Yorkers are making. But then you make that up in bonuses, you know. But 
you don't really learn how to do the investing part at your job at an investment bank. You know, you're taught to do what your piece of the puzzle is in that bank. You learn to do different things in, in regards to your actual position, but not as long as like trading for your individual self. Now, on top of that, too, when it comes to working at an investment bank, I would say it's the same as with any industry. There are people living paycheck to paycheck. Oh, yeah. No matter how much they're making. Right. So right. it really, I always tell people, it's not all the time how much you make, it's how much you save. Because I knew people struggling then when we were at the banks, and I just couldn't understand it. Yeah, you'll have people saying, you're making $400,000 a year, and like, how am I going to pay for my kid's school? I didn't get enough of my bonuses yet. And you look at them like, you're so out of touch with reality, but that's their reality too, you know? Because if your expenses are that high, you need to make a certain amount of money to try to maintain that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Now, do both of you own multi-unit properties? Yes. In, in New York? Okay. Yes. So that definitely has contributed to your wealth? Oh, yeah. It also helps speed up the financial independence part for us, too. Because mm -hmm. you know, with my multifamily, the way I looked at it, I looked at the cash flow of the property when I first initially put the money down to make sure that this will be able for, this is something that will bring in money that will allow me to not have to, to live rent free in New York City. Let's put it that way. Right. I structured it in a way that it's easy for my family to maintain our lifestyle without having to worry about the mortgage coming into play. Now the, the building that you live in, it's a two family or three family plus a store. Three. And a three. Plus a store. Mm -hmm. three in a store. So you have three rental units. You live in one. Yeah. And you own and operate your very own cafe in Bedford Stuyvesant called McDonough Cafe. Yep. Yes. So you have multiple streams of income. We also right? rent out the garage spaces too. Not yeah. even really. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> maximizing. <laughs> Thanks for saying that, Nicole. But yeah, I'm maximizing the potential. That's the whole deal. You got to use whatever square space you have in New York City to make the most out of it. Now, okay, let's talk about FIRE. So for the viewers that are not familiar with the FIRE movement, FIRE is an acronym, Financial Independence, Retire Early. I happened to stumble upon a YouTube video on FIRE last summer. But this has been around for years, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. been around since at least the 70s. I would say wow. like everyone probably agrees that the godfather or the godparents of the movement were probably Vicki Robbins and uh, Joe Dominguez mm -hmm. wrote a book called Your Money or Your Life. Mm -hmm. And that was published back in like 1970 something. But the movement actually became known as the fire movement in around 2010 or so, where people like a, a blogger called Mr. Money Mustache made it very popular. But the, the mindset of it has been around for a long time. Yeah, I just figured out my, um, my in-laws are original gangsters when it comes to this, your money or your life. <laughs> they don't even, they've never even heard of the fire movement, but they have been doing it since the 70s. So can you tell us what it entails? Okay, so the fire movement in general, it's, it's a movement where they actually have put a number that you can uh, come up with, which is your financial independence number, your retirement, your early retirement number. So they say, take your monthly expenses, multiply that by 12. So you have your yearly expenses. Mm -hmm. Then they want you to multiply that yearly expense number by 25. That will give you the number you need to be financially independent and retire early because you will have come up with a number that if you actually were able to get that into a bank account, will allow you to sustain your living expenses for 25 years. Right. Or more, depending on how you bring down your expenses. Exactly. So basically what you want to do is try to bring in income outside of your job mm -hmm. to go over your expenses, and that way you can live financially independent for the rest of your life. Now, you, you both were able to retire not adhering to this movement, not even knowing about it, right? I didn't even know that. I think most people of color don't know about this movement, which is very surprising. Yeah, I would say we found out about it maybe about two years ago too, the actual fire movement. So what steps did you take? I mean, you were, you were gangster savers. What else? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining that you both lived within your means. You we, lived live, we both live below our means. Okay. Yeah, so I was paying probably $800 a month for 10 years when I was working at uh, Goldman and on Wall Street. 
I was living in Queens at the time, small apartment. I had a old car. And other than that, I really wasn't spending much money. We would go on, Nadia and I would go on trips, but we were never flashy. We never, you know, had any fancy cars, any fancy jewelry, nothing that really said we're keeping up with the Joneses, no fancy clothes. Right. And I think that was one big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we got into our retirement accounts fairly early. We started at 20, I was kind of late at 22, but uh, I had a boss that said, Nicole, I want to show you something called compounding interest. Mm -hmm. And when he showed me that, I called Nadia up right away and said, we're going to go and do our retirement accounts right now. And wow. we just started putting our money in to our 401ks um, every paycheck. And that started to grow. And then from then, once we left the banks, we started investing in different things. And then I followed Nadia because Nadia was set on finding a multifamily place to invest in. So we were trying different ways to bring in money. So can you tell us what compounding interest is for those of us who are not that financially savvy? Nadia, you want to take it? Well, yeah, it's when the interest on your money makes money. Right. You know, so say, you, uh, say you put in $100 mm -hmm. and then at the end of the year, it turns into 110. Mm -hmm. The following year, now you have 110 that's going to make interest on it, mm -hmm. you know? So it's your interest and your money keeps building and building. And at one point, your money is making money and it's working for itself. And, and the longer you have it in there, like, yeah, and it's like a snowball. So as long as you have it in there, you have more time for your money to make money upon itself. Right, right. Now, some of the research that I did on this movement, I, I watched several videos and I saw that people were living these extreme lifestyles. I mean, it was practically a rice and beans diet every <laughs> day. Now, it actually is quite intimidating. So what would you say are the pros and the cons of this, this lifestyle? Well, there's two, there's extremes on in the fire movement, right? You have lean fire, you have fat fire. It all depends on what kind of lifestyle you want to have and what you're comfortable with living for the next 30, 40 years, you know? If you're comfortable living off of 3000 a month and that's good for you, then you're going to probably be more towards the lean side. But if you say, look, my fire for me is going to be 10000 a month. I want to live comfortable when I'm 60 years old and I like going out and I like, like nice things, then your number is going to be much higher. So there's different extremes. So you have to find your number that's right for you and what you feel comfortable with. If you're not comfortable eating rice and beans, there's an in-between. You know? Well, there's also, it's a time frame. These guys eating rice and beans, they want to retire within the next two years. Right. Now, if your time frame is 10 or 15 years, you have some flexibility. Okay. So there is flexibility within the movement. And you'll see some people that are just, you know, average people just relaxing and not eating rice and beans. But they're probably still cooking at home four times a week. Yep. Now, I saw a, a video this afternoon where Susie Orman, <laughs> she hates the fire movie. She hates it. I mean, to the point where she was pretty rabid, like, oh, I hate it. And so I said, okay, well, what is this? Why does she hate this movement so much? And she was just explaining that for someone who retires at, let's say, 30, the life expectancy is increasing. So what if they live until 95? And what if they run out of their money at 75 anyway? So she's very concerned about people not working through their, through their compounding years, I think she mm -hmm. said. Yeah, she's worried about that you're losing out on your younger years when you can work a lot and get your money, earn a lot more money to help you through those retirement. But I think what she's missing is that a lot of people who do the fire movement, they just don't stop and retire. You right. retire from working for someone else, and then you use your life to do what you want. And you're still bringing in money because the whole purpose is for you to bring in passive income, you know? Right. But you're not just stopping. Some people do a fire movement and do many retirements. Maybe you'll take a year off and just travel around the world and not do anything. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're really into the fire movement, you want your money to last that long, you'll still have money coming in. You just won't be working in a traditional job that you're doing it specifically for the money. I would also say when Suze Ordman says that she hates it, I think what she should hate more, and I just looked this up recently, is that 64% of Americans don't even have enough to retire. Right. So she should give fire moving people credit that yep. they have thought far enough in the future to have money set aside for retirement. 
because someone working 40 years or so and not having any money for retirement, it doesn't matter if you're working or not. If you're still living paycheck to paycheck, that is more concerning. And that's where I say I hate, hate, hate seeing people work so long and seeing 70-year-old people working a job and being on their feet all day just because something happened that they had to keep working. Yeah. Meta Haiti, she should try to work with the fire movement. And we we really like Sue's Armin too. I love Suzy Armin. Like I followed a lot of her stuff. There was a lot of her books that I read that helped me along my journey to get to the position I am now. But one thing she's forgetting also is that people who do the fire movement, these people are planners, you know, they're thinking risk diverse. long term. Diverse. They're very risk diverse. So they're thinking long term. So if they see their money dwindling, they're gonna do something. If you start working at 20 and you see that maybe you didn't plan it out correctly, what's stopping you to go back into the workforce at 40, you know? It's not, it's something that's more flexible. But when it comes to working for 40 years or 30 years and you have nothing that can hold you over when you really need it and you can't work anymore, that's, a, that's something that the whole world should be mad at, you know? Well, Nicole, you said there are a lot of people who don't have money to retire. I mean, you look at the situation that we're in now globally, this pandemic, it's very eye-opening. Mm -hmm. this, this experience and also two years ago, the government shutdown. Well, that was a glimpse into what was gonna happen now. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely ring the alarm moments in American history because you're seeing, these were government workers mm -hmm. who did not have money to get through the next month. They weren't even out for a full month. Right. They were trying to sell blood plasma. People right. were out there selling blood plasma to get by. And then look at this now. We're in what, week eight? Yeah. And food banks have thousands and thousands of people waiting for food. So that's very telling. And I mean, we're having this conversation not to make people feel bad because people are working two and three, 10 jobs, okay? And it's, it's an eye-opening experience to know that something is not working here. Something is not working. And it's not putting blame on us as the citizens of this country, but the expenses are too high, wages mm -hmm. are stagnant, and people are, having, people are not living their lives. They're just surviving. Not just that, look at the debt number. The fact that so many Americans are in debt and the government is in debt is another sign that people should look out for. Everyone was thinking we're in the best time. These last 11 years were the greatest growing times of America. But credit cards kept a lot of things afloat. Now, when the credit card agencies are cutting your, your, your credit line and you don't have a job, the times weren't as good as you thought they were. And America being in so much in debt, we're going to pay for that later on. All this money that's being put into the system will have to be paid back. And right. people don't understand that the fire movement people said, I don't want a situation like this. When worse, when it gets worse or push come to shove, I want to be able to say that I have enough money to sustain myself, not depend on a job. The unemployment numbers are skyrocketing. Every 30 week. million people. 30 million people. Right. And you, these guys are saying, and really what we say too, a job is one of the riskiest things you can have because you can't control it and they can get rid of you anytime they want. This time it might be because of COVID. Next time it could be something else. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is try to protect yourself and think about your money and your expenses first. So one thing that you did was you lived below your means. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know as a single woman, there was a time in my life where I was broke. You know, I graduated from college with a judgment on my credit because the credit card companies, they swoop down on college campuses mm -hmm. and they prey on students. So here I was, young and dumb, was not thinking about it. And then I graduated with this, this judgment. But fortunately, I started to think about debt. I hate debt. I don't like being broke. I don't like hiding from my mailbox when I come home, you know, <laughs> which is real. Because I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to open up that mailbox to see what's there waiting for me. And so I finally got myself to a position where I'm not sweating bullets right now. You know, I, I started to save my money and I can live more comfortably. Whereas now, as a real estate agent, we're not allowed to work due to the um, shelter in place executive order. 
but there are some agents mm -hmm. right now who are sweating bullets. So living below your means. Now, what would you say to the people who have multiple jobs and they're looking at this and they're like, oh, well, that's great for you. <laughs> you know, that's nice that you're millionaires. Mm -hmm. what, what, what does this mean for me? They may not be able to wrap their heads around this concept right now because they don't have enough money to get a Metro card. What would, what, mm -hmm. would be, what would you say to these? I would like to just point out first our backgrounds. Nadia and I grew up in the projects in New York City during the 80s, right? One of the worst times in New York City. Okay. We grew up with a single mother. Our mother passed away suddenly. So we didn't get the option. We had to learn early on, you got to save some money because mm -hmm. All our, we're the last out of six, but all our brothers and sisters were older and they all had a family to take care of. So it was not in a call, you're on your own. So it wasn't a matter of, hey, let me get some time to make things work. It was a matter of like, it starts today, else we don't eat today. So that was one thing. Now, when it comes to a person that's working two or three jobs, financial freedom should not be the first thing you think about. The first thing you should think about is not living paycheck to paycheck. How can you stop living paycheck to paycheck? You have to take baby steps. Mm -hmm. What can I do today so that I can save at least 10 cents of this paycheck that I just made? Okay, because it's hard to think about anything else when you have your, you can't even keep your head above water. Right. So forget about freedom, start with living paycheck, stop living paycheck to paycheck, and then move on. You know, try to find whatever you can do. Maybe it is you move in with a roommate, maybe it is you learn a skill at night, or find a way to get the next position up at the job you're in so that maybe you can drop one of those jobs. Mm -hmm. But you gotta take baby steps and think a little bit past tomorrow, then think one year ahead. Mm -hmm. So that you can get to that point where you can think about financial freedom. Yeah, and I don't want people to misconstrue that financial freedom equals millionaire status, right? It's whatever is the number that you're comfortable with, you know? So if making, if having 3,000 a month makes you feel like a millionaire because that covers all your expenses and you have money left over, then you are financially independent, okay? So there's steps to this, and it's just based on the individual. That's the main reason I would tell people, like, just save a little bit of money here and there. Even if you've got to pay yourself first and one bill has to slip, put some money aside. you got to get into the habit because at the end of the day, we're seeing the government is not going to take care of you. And if they do take care of you, there might be a lot of people online right next to you or in front of you, and it might take a long time for you to get any money that they're going to be giving out, you know? And it's, it's always a good idea to find different ways to make money, too. You know, maybe having two or three jobs is a good thing because you got different ways to bring in money. But maybe try to think about how I can make some money on the side. A lot of people do hair. A lot of people knit things. Mm -hmm. Everyone has some type of skill they can use. Bank yeah. sales, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I know for myself, when I was saving for my house, I was a beast with it as well. I did not have a cell phone. I did not have cable. Every time I paid something with a dollar, let's say if I bought something for 75 cents, that quarter went into savings. Mm -hmm. And you know, I really lived below my means and I was just saving and saving and saving. And then plus also, I didn't listen to the people who told me that my dream was impossible. I mean, at the time my goal was to save up and get at least $10,000 for a down payment. And I was told constantly, oh, you're not going to find a house with only $10,000 down. I did. You're not going to find a house near the A train um, with only $10,000 down. I did. Okay. And then also I found a house. I wanted a house that was a fixer upper. I got exactly what I envisioned. And then also another thing I'm hoping that people take away from this, you may not be able to see this as a possibility for you now, but I'm just hoping that this conversation starts to just plant seeds in your mind. Mm -hmm. When I started to look for my house, I was not ready, but I was uh, putting the wheels in motion towards that. So I was cultivating the soil, watering it. And then a year later, the 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 seeds started to, to blossom they started to to sprout and then bloom and then here i am in a house that is exactly what my dream was so yeah I, a lot of people know it took me 10 years to save up the down payment for my house right and i just kept i said you know what i will buy a house i'll keep putting money away i'll just diligently 
make sure I keep saving. But I went and looked at houses. I looked at different types of property. I kept looking around to see, okay, how would I assess this type of property? What am I looking for? What don't I like? So you get in a habit. So when the right house comes along for you, you know you can jump on it. You know, you just have to keep waiting and prepare yourself so that when that opportunity comes up, you can pounce on it. And then even once I got in, once I got into the house, I mean, there were still things for years I did not have a washer and dryer. (laughs) You know, I was cooking off of a hot plate. I did not have a stove. But now I have all of that. You know, and once again, living below my means. Another thing is, is um, I'm in real estate. I come across a lot of stories. Some of my clients are going in together. Like I have clients who are two families. They want to buy a three family property so they can have one that's an uh, additional income coming in. One family has one apartment. Another has the the other. Then I'm... (laughs) I've read articles where people are, two families are partnering up and living within a two family, excuse me, a two bedroom apartment. Now, a lot of people would not be, would not be willing to do that, but give yourself a goal. It's not like you're going to do that for the rest of your life, you know? At least you have equity in something. I have friends who did the same thing. They bought a, I think it's a two family it was the owner duplex, and then you had like a two-bedroom apartment upstairs. Right. So one family said, we're going to stay in this section of the house. They pay for that section. The other family, they said, okay, we're going to buy this one, and we're going to rent out the other room. And it works for them. You just have to be flexible. I, I think it, you both are highlighting something that I think about all the time. You don't, even if you don't have money, you don't have to have a broke mindset. You right. see, there's two ways of thinking it. It's like, some people are broke because they just don't have money. But as long as you have ideas and you say this is where, and you have a vision, you're going to be all right. There are people that are going to be on their feet no matter what. And it's because of their mindset. So you can't look at today and say it's going to be the same as tomorrow. But if you have a broke mindset, then you're going to stay broke. Yeah. You know, broke can be temporary. Right. Well, somebody who's making, like those former coworkers of yours, they could be making a half a million and be broke mentally. Oh, they were. Yeah. And it's like, don't get fooled by the big rings or the shiny cars and everything like that. Those people I know are struggling. Right. So like, never fall for what people have on the outside. Just worry about your own situation and make sure that you're good. That's one thing. We never follow what everybody else was doing. Our friends were getting nice cars. They were buying big houses. I'm like, you know what? I'm not ready for that. And I'm not one of those people who like to show things and then I feel inauthentic if that's not really what's going on in my life, you know, if I'm struggling to maintain that. I don't want to live like that. So I made sure I did everything in my time and made sure that it was the best move for me and my family. Right. Yeah. Another thing that I always tell my clients is, okay, so Nadia, you and I, we live in Bed-Stuy. Bed-Stuy was not what it is today. I mean, to me, it's always been a fabulous neighborhood. But I bought my house when Brooklyn was still being called Brooklyn, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the day I told my dad, you know what, dad, I want to move to Bed-Stuy. And he flipped out. He was like, why do you want to move there? People are moving out of that neighborhood. But I had vision. And, you know, to the people who want to live in Bed-Stuy, but maybe they're not able to afford a house or an apartment, you know, I tell them all the time, there are other neighborhoods that are just as nice. Maybe it doesn't have the, you know, latte cafe on the corner. But I, I, I tell people all the time, go to a neighborhood like Brownsville and make it the neighborhood that you want it to be. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of great properties in Brownsville, as well as East New York, as well as Newark, you know, Jersey City. So you have to look beyond what a neighborhood is today. I agree. Well, let me ask you, ladies, are there any financial podcasts that you listen to or books that you would suggest? I would say say, uh, one that we really like is Nurses on Fire. Okay. Uh, It's a a podcast ran by a lady named Nasima, who was able to get herself out of close to a million dollars in debt. She's the debt player. Yes, in two years. Wow. She now she's a nurse and she has a podcast called Nurses on Fire. So she has a very interesting story. 
um, in terms of YouTube, I say the Well Twins, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we have a very interesting story too, and we share, you know, our tips and tricks and try to help people as much as we can on different subjects along with investing, uh, saving, and getting rid of debt. Uh, in terms of books, I would say Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. Mm -hmm. He's uh, pretty big in the fire movement, if you haven't heard about him. And he, very, he makes it very simple for people to understand and to get started. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say another podcast would probably be Choose FI, if you haven't heard of that. Okay. Um, Book-wise, I would say one that I give to my nieces and nephews that are in their teenage years and older. It's called From Flipping Burgers to Flipping Millions. It's about a guy who started his first job at McDonald's, and he kept moving up in position, and he showed how he kept saving his money to become a millionaire. Very quick read. Um, I say the, your money or your life. If you really about this fire movement, <laughs> then that is the Bible right there. It's a little too extreme for me, but there's certain things that I, I've taken away from that book. Like they have a term called the Vingus pins, mm -hmm. and it's something that you just buy out of habit. And you're like, oh, I want that, I want that. And then you look at it like, this is bringing me nothing, and I always go for it. That's me when it comes to knitting and yarn. But I've started to control that habit. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something that at least if you don't want to follow the fire movement, you can find a lot of um, tactics in there that will get you to stop living paycheck to paycheck, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. right. right. And I would say, you know, this time that I'm not sure how many people are living uh, outside of New York City, but if you're living in New York City right now, this is a great time to start thinking about the fire movement because you are now basically having to make choices, which the fire movement makes you do. You have to make choices where you're going to spend your money. And I know for myself, I'm saving a lot of money because I'm just going out to buy food. Right. Other than that, there's no nail salons, there's no hair salons, you know, there's no movie theaters, there's no dinners out. Mm -hmm. So if you realize right now, this is what you can live on. Mm -hmm. This is what you can survive on. All the other stuff, <laughs> yeah, we've been doing it for eight weeks. All the other stuff are nice to have. Right. Now you can pick when everything is back to normal, hopefully soon, which one of those nice to haves you're going to bring back into your life. But the money that you're saving now can show you. Not all is not about how much more money you need to make, it's how much money you can actually save when you focus on it. Wow. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Once again, Nadia and Nicole, the Wealth Twins, check out their YouTube channel. I will include all of their uh, information below in the description. And thank you. This no, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I love the show and I love the bling bling. <laughs> yes, that's a great idea. Yes, yes. And it's right. also, if you, for the people who are listening, Nadia had a little something special for them, right? Oh, yeah. We have a free investing course for people. Okay. If you guys want to learn how to get in, involved in investing, we have a free course that will walk you through the basic terms of investing and how to get started to booking your first trade. And we have a link for you, too. It's called uh, wealthwins.com slash investing. And we'll give that to you. Uh, so you can pass it on to whoever you want. And we appreciate uh, being on your show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great weekend, ladies. You Bye too. Take care. Bye-bye.